Now, going back to the Prohibition, one of the biggest outfit hits ever was more of a massacre, hence the name St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Al Capone's gang dressed as policemen, and they raided Bugs Moran's warehouse. They lined everybody up. They pulled out machine guns and killed everybody inside except Bugs Moran. He actually escaped, and one of the trigger men was none other than Tony Arcardo. Now, this one really breaks your heart. You got the suspicious death of Marilyn Monroe. This crime is still unsolved today. The prime suspects, though, are Frankie Schweiss and Tony Spilatro. Allegedly, they gained access into their, her hotel room, gave her a lethal dose, a shot in the ass, killing her, and made it look like suicide. Now, when notorious outfit boss Sam Momo Giancana got killed in his own house, it made world news. He was cooking peppers and sausage. He let in somebody he trusted. They shot him several times, one time in the mouth. And the gun used in this murder was actually made by Ronnie Jarrett and Frank Calabrese Jr. Some people think his good friend Butch did it. Some people think Tony Spilatro. Some people even think Arcardo. Who do you think? Now, the outfit bosses have had enough of Mad Sam's shenanigans. He was bringing on way too much heat. So that his own brother, Mario DeStefano and Tony Spilatro, they tricked, they conned Mad Sam and told him that they finally found the informant, the guy they were looking for. So when they met at Mad Sam's house, Tony Spilatro, with a shotgun, blasted Mad Sam, blowing off his arm, killing him, leaving him in his own garage floor. Another victim of organized crime, you got Crooked Cop, FBI Mole, Snitch, close associate Sam Giancana, Dick Kane. I walk past this crime scene every day. You got Jimmy Boy Kozel's old place, Rosie's Snack Shop. One day, two masked gunmen walked in, lined everybody up, announced the robbery. One of the gunmen walked up to Dick Kane and blew off his head. Alleged trigger men were Joy Lombardo, Harry Alleman, or Marshall Cuffone. Now, Giancana and all his close buddies started to all get clipped. For example, Johnny Roselli. He was uh, Giancana's, one of Giancana's right-hand men. He was involved in the plot to kill Fidel Castro. He was involved, allegedly, in the plot to kill the Kennedys. And they eventually found him in Biscayne Bay, Florida, stuffed in a 55-gallon drum. Now, probably one of the most brutal, violent uh, murders was that of William Axon Jackson. He was a, a main killer for Sam Giancana. Giancana was paranoid, thought that maybe he was an informant. So he had James Turk Torello, Angelo Petria, and Jack Cerrone got a hold of him. They brutally torched him, stabbed him up, even castrated him before eventually killing him. But he never gave up anything, and these guys started to question if he was a rat or not. Now, I remember uh, seeing this all over the news when it happened. They whacked Alan Dorfman broad daylight in the parking lot right outside the Purple Hilton Hotel. This is a hotel a lot of us used to hang out at. During the Family Secret Trial, they played the tapes of Joey Lombardo saying Dorfman was weak and humble and mild and not a tough guy. But in reality, Dorfman was a tough guy. He was a Marine, and a lot of guys in the neighborhood said he did some work. Now, one of the first hits, one of the first pieces of work that Tony Spilatro did for the outfit was the M&M murders, Jimmy Maraglia and Bill McCarthy. These guys fucked up. They killed the Scavone brothers on Taylor Street without getting an okay from the outfit bosses. These guys were grabbed, tortured. They put his head in his vice. They squeezed it, popped out one of his eye. Then they slit their throats from ear to ear, killing both of them, sending a message. Now, in the Chicago outfit, if you botch a hit, you're going to end up trunk music, like these two Mama Lukes. Chicago outfit associates Jasper Campisi, his good friend John Catuzzo. They were given the green light to kill Chinatown Lieutenant Gambling Boss Ken Ito. They shot him a few times, but they used weak ammunition. Ito survived, ended up testifying against them, and both of these guys ended up in the trunk of Campisi's car. 
Now, the Chicago outfit is responsible for literally hundreds of murders, most of them all wise guys or an associates within their circle that fucked up, like this guy here, Jimmy the Bomber Kentura. He got killed right there in the neighborhood on Hubbard in Ogden, and right across the street, that's where Pat's Bee's restaurant used to be. This is where Spilatro's family-owned restaurant was, where all the Chicago outfit guys used to hang out. Now, two of the largest bookies back then were Robert Plummer and Hal Smith. They brought in millions of dollars to Rocky and Felice's crew in the Chicago outfit. Rocky demanded more money. They both refused. These guys both, on separate occasions, ended up beaten, stabbed up, tortured, strangled, and killed. And B.J. Jehoda here testified how he lured both of his good friends to their deaths. Now imagine sitting 10 feet away from this guy in the right, Anthony the Hatch Chiramante. Joe Lopez could not control him in court. He was actually worse than Frankie the Breeze. He had a fallout with Mikey Sarno and Frank the German shortly after that. Tough Tony Calabrese, no relation to Frank or Nick, pulled up in a van at a Browns Chicken and Lions, got out and shot and killed the Hatch several times. Now, here's another unsolved uh, crime by the Chicago outfit, and this time it wasn't one of their own that were killed, which is usually the case. You got BP executive, Mr. Pierman. He had major beef with Chicago outfit associate, uh, Frank Molino, and allegedly Mario Renone, who I seen at the Gus Alex trial, and a crooked cop killed Mr. Pierman. But nobody was ever charged. Now, here's a heavyweight here, Charles, the typewriter, Nicoletti. This gentleman uh, was allegedly involved in the JFK assassination. Did a lot of heavy work with Milwaukee Phil Aldericio. And eventually, he was shot and killed in the head by none other than Harry Elliman. Another Chicago outfit guy they took out. Now, here's one of my favorite wise guys, Rocky and Felice, World War II paratrooper. He was also the underboss to Joe Ferriola, and they demanded the street tax be doubled on every drug dealer, every burglar, every thief. You either had to pay, you had to quit, or you had to die. And according to Calabrese, he thought he seen Rocky out of the corner of his eye at the house in Bensonville. Now, here's a mysterious, unsolved death of Jerry Scarpelli. He was a Mad Hatter for the Chicago outfit with the Wild Bunch crew. And while he was locked up at the MCC jail downtown, he committed suicide. They found him with a bag over his head. His hands were behind his back, zip-tied. But on the same floor was Frank the German Schweiss. And most of us believe Frankie Schweiss killed Scarpelli. Now, in the Chicago outfit, if you get out of line, they won't hesitate to take you out. For example, made member of the Chicago outfit from the Wild Bunch, you got William Butchie Petroselli. Frank Calabrese hated this man, asked Angelo several times if he could kill him. And then one day, the Breeze got his wish. They summoned Butchie to Angelo's club. Angelo said, go take out the garbage. He walked next door, and these guys jumped him and killed him. Now, Nick Calabrese testified how they had a hell of a time tailing, tracking, and killing trucking executive Michael Cagnoni. This poor man was paying the outfit for years, but they squeezed him for more money. He refused, so they ended up blowing him up. Nick Calabrese testified when he entered the ramp on 294, Nick hit the button, blowing his Mercedes and his body parts to smithereens. Now, it's very rare that Chicago Alpha will kill a female, but in this case, they had no choice. You had career criminal Billy Dauber, real scumbag, and his wife, Charlotte Dauber, kind of like a Bonnie and Clyde. After testifying in front of the grand jury, they were come out of a court built court building in Will County. They were chased down in the car by Frank Calabrese, Ronnie Jarrett, Butch Petroselli and Scarpelli, and both husband and wife were shotgun blasted by the crew. Now, Danny Seifert's murder 
in my opinion, could have been prevented, like Hoffa. Both of them were warned many, many times to back down. Neither one would listen. Seifert's testimony could have had a major impact on the Central Teamsters pension fund. That was worth hundreds of millions of dollars back in the 70s. It was the mob's golden goose, their piggy bank. But the hit team was John Faccarada, the driver, Joey Hansen, the shooter, Tony Spilatro, the German, and Joey Lombardo. Now, Joey Upa, Boston Chicago outfit, was very worried that Emo Vachi will testify and put him in prison along with others. So they had to take him out as part of the uh, West Coast trip. The Indian, Pauly Sherrill, one of the defendants of the Family Secret Trial, he acted as the lookout while Joey Hansen and Nick Calabrese pulled up the Vachi, slid open the van door, grabbed them and killed them and dumped them in the desert. Now, when the Spalatro brothers were found, this made major news. These bodies were supposed to never be found. And I'll never forget seeing Nick Calabrese in court go into great detail on how these guys were killed. He said when Michael came down the stairs, they all had gloves on. Michael was the first to greet him. Michael shook his hand, immediately dove for his ankles, while Louis the Mooch strangled him with a rope from behind. After that, Tony was beat and stomped by all the heavyweights in the outfit. Now here you got Ronnie Jarrett. He was part of the 26th Street crew. Talked about a lot of the Family Secrets trial. Did a lot of work with Frank Calabrese and Nick Calabrese. But when Johnny Apes took over as the new boss of the 26th Street crew, Ronnie Jarrett disrespected him. They had beef. And eventually, Tony Calabrese shot and killed Ronnie Jarrett right across the street from his house on his way to a week. Now, you can just imagine how upset J.B. was when he received the phone call in Palm Springs that his house in River Forest got broken into. He made one phone call to Tony Spilatro. Tony told him there's only one man that could pull off a burglary like that, and that was John Mendel. Arcardo gave the green light, rounded up John Mendel, and 10-plus well-known burglars. Every one of them was brutally tortured, stabbed up, and killed, sending a very strong message. Nick Calabrese testified in great detail on the uh, murders of Vincent Moretti, who was one of the burglars at the Tony Accardo house, and Don Reno. He was actually wearing Tony Accardo's cufflinks that he recovered from the burglary. He testified that they tortured Vincent Moretti and ended up strangling Reno. And why they were killing him, Strangers in the Night in the Jukebox was playing it was pretty intense, better than any TV show, better than any movie, to see Nick Calabrese calmly testify on his first murder. He participated with his brother, Frank. They killed Michael Hambone Albergo. He was going around town saying, well, if he's going away, he's not going away alone. They grabbed him. They strangled him with a rope. Frank Calabrese had one end of the rope. Nick Calabrese had the other. Nick Calabrese was so scared, he pissed in his pants, and they buried him at Comiskey Park. Now, here's Tony Borsellino, member of the old Wild Bunch crew. This guy did a lot of heavy work for the outfit. He participated in killing a lot of the uh, burglars that robbed uh, Arcardo's house. Frank Calabrese went to Angelo, pleading with him to save his life. Angelo replied, would you like to go in his place? Uh, but unfortunately for Tony Borsellino, he was found shot multiple times in a field out in the suburbs. Now, probably the most recent uh, Chicago outfit murder, but it's still uh, kind of a missing persons case, unsolved. You got made member, real close to Jimmy Marcello. You got Anthony Little Toe Zizzo. He left Ambrusos restaurant, Melrose Park, was on his way to a meeting downtown at Rush Street, but never made that meeting. A lot of people suspect foul play, or he lambed it. What do you think?